The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Jesus himself came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were still disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, starting from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John and Peter were walking to the temple one day to pray and to worship when they came across a beggar. Have you ever come across a beggar? If you live in the Seattle-Tacoma metropolitan area, then of course you have. What, does that react, what reaction does that elicit in you? How does that make you feel? What does that make you think? The beggar was being carried to a place called the Beautiful Gate, outside the temple. It's ironic because a beggar bothering people for money is anything but beautiful. Nevertheless, this was his practice. He, and presumably others like him, chose this time and this place to beg because that's when people went to the temple to pray and worship. And such people, in such a frame of mind, may be inclined to be more generous, or at least more pitying. Something else I find ironic about this is that I wonder if the beggar wouldn't have been allowed in the very place in front of which he was begging, the place where all of his patrons were going. He'd been lame from birth, which might have been due to physical deformity that might have left him ritually unclean. But even if I'm wrong about that, I can't help but wonder if in his poverty he would have been unclean in other ways unable, perhaps, to follow the various regulations about keeping kosher or personal hygiene or the like. Because of this, he must remain outside of the temple, outside of people's sight, out of their minds. Outside the temple, sitting on his mat, he could be safely ignored except for the few moments when people had to walk past and perhaps toss him a few coins. He is outside, they are inside. That is, until Peter and John show up. Unlike everyone else, when the beggar asks for change, they don't hand him some money and walk past. They stop. St. Luke says that Peter looked at the man intently, told him, look at us. He made eye contact. Have you ever done that? Made eye contact with someone holding one of those cardboard signs? What did you talk to them about? What did you say? I keep calling the man a beggar, but that's really not what he is. He's not a beggar. He's a man who's begging. Peter and John see this. They don't write him off as some obstacle to be avoided or an obligation to fulfill. They see him as a person. They look at him. Everybody else looks at the man and says that he is other, sees that he's not like me, that he's not my problem. 
And while everyone else was hurrying to get inside and do the important work of praying and worshiping, Peter and John stopped outside. They talked to him. He asked them for money, but they didn't give him any. Instead, Peter says, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he did. He got up, and then he started walking. And then he started leaping and dancing and singing. And then he followed Peter and John right into the temple. That's what gets everyone's attention. That's what astonishes them, that this outsider has come inside. And when he sees that astonishment, that's when Peter speaks. He says, I don't see what the big deal is. Why are y'all gawking at us? You think we made him walk? That we, what, waved our magic wands and abracadabra gave him the use of his legs? That kind of power, Peter says, doesn't belong to him and John. It belongs to Jesus. What Peter explains to everyone is that there are two kinds of power in this world. The first kind, the kind that we all know and that we all use every day, is the power to make people other. The power to create outsiders, scapegoats. That's the kind of power that these good church-going folk used against Jesus. They and their rulers determined that Jesus was a problem, an enemy, and so they did what we typically do to enemies. We put them outside, outside our homes, outside our communities, outside our temples and synagogues and churches. We lock them away in prisons and institutions, whatever it takes to separate them from us. In Jesus' case, they did the most separating thing that they could. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree for all to see. The message here is clear. Don't be like this guy. This is what we do to outsiders. But the second kind of power, Jesus' power, that's different. See, Jesus doesn't make outsiders, he makes insiders. He brings people in. That's what he did his whole life. He ate with sinners and tax collectors. He called fishermen and women to be his disciples. He made room for everyone at God's table and in God's house. And that's what made him a threat, an enemy. That's what got him killed. But... Even after being killed, he still reached out and brought people in. Even after being rejected by his own people, abandoned by his friends, denied by Peter, he still reached out. Even across the boundary of life and death and brought all those people back in. Our power, the power to make outsiders, is the power to kill. It's the power to take life. Jesus' power, the power to make insiders, is the power to give life. Y'all use your power against Jesus, Peter says. But even after that, Jesus still has the power to make this man walk, to give him his life back. And then, and then, Peter works another miracle. He does the very same thing a second time. He brings all these outsiders in. He brings life where there once was death. He talks to these people, these people who walk past beggars and crucify messiahs, and he says to them, friends, I know that what you and your rulers did was done in ignorance. I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. I am here to let you know that what Jesus did for this man 
is exactly what Jesus is waiting to do for you. To take away all that separates you from God and to give you your lives back. And St. Luke says that 5,000 people accepted that invitation that day. I think what's most remarkable to me about this story is that these people to whom Peter is speaking are his enemies. They're the ones who shouted crucify in the crowds and got his friend and his teacher executed. Enemies are dangerous because they are different. They have different values from us, different goals. And that difference makes them dangerous. It's why we put them outside of us, make them them and us us. Why we make them other. But just like that man who used to beg in the street, Peter doesn't look at them and see others. He looks at them and he sees fellow Israelites, friends. He calls them brothers in Greek, siblings. He looks at them and he sees himself. He sees how he too denied and abandoned Jesus. The harm done by these people in the temple was real, but it was no less real than the harm that Peter himself had done. By loving them, by recognizing his kinship with them and his similarity with them, rather than hating them and othering them, Peter is able to face that evil in himself as well as the evil caused by these others. He's able to grow into a better disciple, a better apostle, a better person. When we look at people and see our differences, we feel fear and anger and hate. When we make people other, it's easy to point the finger, to be disgusted or confounded by those terrible beliefs that those people have or their terrible behaviors or their terrible actions. That's why it's so easy to cancel and ostracize people for something like being a racist, for example, but so hard to face those racist attitudes or beliefs or actions that we ourselves hold or commit, even in ignorance. When we look at people and see our similarity, we have empathy, love, compassion. Peter looks at his enemies and sees people like him. He sees himself And that allows him to speak to them, not in anger or condemnation or in threat, but in love, in a genuine care and concern for their well-being, for the well-being of the people who killed his master. When we other people, we keep them as beggars, and we keep ourselves as the kind of people who walk past beggars, We separate ourselves with this great uncrossable chasm between us, but Jesus crosses the uncrossable chasm. He, who once was dead, returns to life. The power to cross that chasm is love. When Peter and John first encounter the man who was begging, they had no money and they said as much, but what they did have, what they had in abundance was the love of Jesus. Jesus, who is God's love incarnate. Jesus loved his disciples to the end, as St. John says. Elsewhere, he writes that Jesus came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Peter and John gave what they had first been given in abundance. They gave the love of Christ. They looked at that man in the eyes and they cared about him and they saw him as a person. They gave him respect. They acknowledged his dignity. They didn't see him as a beggar or an other. Is it any wonder, then, that this man was able to walk? This is the miracle, my friends that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are.
people born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of a man, but of God. People who have been put to death and reborn in the same love of God from which the entire world itself was created and given life. See what love the Father has given us. This love not only makes the lame walk, it comes to us when we are blinded by fear and anger and hatred to help us see that just as in this story, enemies and friends are often one in the same. It gives us the power to see that us and them are more alike than we are different. It gives us the power to see the power, the ability to love when we could not otherwise.